Hello everyone, so a while ago I told the story of Charles Becker, who was the first American police officer sentenced to death and executed in America. Today's story is on Len Davis. He was also a former corrupt police officer, and he is currently on death row. Len Davis was born on August 6, 1964. As an adult, he decided to become a police officer for the New Orleans Police Department. His track record as a police officer was far from stellar. There was a lot of crime in New Orleans, and instead of there being a group of upstanding police officers, majority of the officers within the NLPD during that time were corrupt just like Len. Len was given the nickname RoboCop by the community because of his size and aggressive nature towards people. Between the years of 1987 and 1992, he was suspended six times and over 20 people had filed complaints against him. Despite the bad track record, he was still awarded a Medal of Merit in 1993. Not only was the community aware of the corruption within the police department, but the FBI was as well, and they decided to do something about it starting in 1994. The FBI placed undercover civilians and officers in the city for their sting, Operation Shattered Shield, and they found out that Len was extorting protection money from a drug dealer who also happened to be an FBI informant. They also wanted to solicit NLPD officers to guard a warehouse holding illegal drugs for shipment. The FBI sting abruptly came to an end on October 13, 1994, because an innocent woman by the name of Kim Groves was murdered and Len was behind it all. Jasmine Groves, who was the daughter of Kim Groves, penned a letter to the public a couple of years ago. My name is Jasmine Groves and I am the youngest of three children of Kim Marie Groves. A former New Orleans police officer, Len Davis put a hit on my mother in retaliation for her witnessing him beat a teenager in our neighborhood and filing a complaint against him. The day my mother reported Officer Davis was the day before my 13th birthday. About 3.30 p.m., she called the office to file the complaint and it usually took 24 to 72 hours for an officer to be notified of a complaint against them. Unfortunately, Davis knew within hours of my mother filing the complaint. By the time she made it home that night, the hit to take her life was already set. Because it was the night before my birthday, my mom was planning my party. My cousin and I were having a sleepover and we were playing cards. My mom came into the room and started singing the happy birthday song. I smiled the whole time she sang because she always made me feel special. For some crazy reason, it felt like she knew she would not get to wish me a happy birthday the next day. After she walked out of the door, within seconds, the phone rang. I was always the one to run to answer it, but that time I wish I hadn't. As I said hello, all I heard was a woman's voice screaming into the phone, Kim has just been shot and I think she's dead. At that moment, my heart stopped. I was stiff. I could not think. I could not talk. I was stuck. I was wishing she'd say she had it wrong. It was a mistake. I dropped the phone and ran screaming to my family. As we all ran out of the door, we saw my mother's body lying in the street, lifeless. As I dialed 911 for help, it took them forever. The next day, I still pushed myself to go to school, even though that didn't last long. I tried to still face life as normally as I could, but nothing was normal about my life anymore. Only a few months later did I learn that the same people I called to help save my mother were the ones who killed my mother. I lost all trust in the police. I remember that to protect and serve was always on NOPD's police cars, and now it's not anymore. I take it as a sign of them no longer protecting and serving. 26 years later, after my mother's murder, my mother's murderer still appeals his sentence. Police corruption has gotten so bad that it seems like it's normal, and that is a sad truth. I feel it's injustice where justice is delayed and denied. My mother died because she stood up for her civil rights and the young people in the Lower Ninth Ward. Taking a stand should not mean taking a death sentence. In order to stop these corrupted cop killings, we need more police to love their job and take a stand with the people. Our voice must become one. I truly believe that citizens and police officers must trust each other instead of working against each other. Without this happening, all I see is failure and chaos. We cannot have police feeling that they are above the law. Just as police cars have to protect and serve, that should also be reflected in their policies. On October 10, 1994, Len was out with his partner, Sammy Williams. Kim Groves witnessed the two officers harass and hit her play nephew, Nathan Norwood, because they believed he was a suspect in a police officer's shooting. 
Kim then filed a complaint within the next couple of days after the assault to NOPD's Internal Affairs Office. Lynn learned about the complaint on October 12th. As mentioned earlier, Lynn had been extorting protection money from drug dealers in the area. Two of these dealers were Paul Hardy and Damon Causey. The men would often do favors for Lynn in exchange for protection, and the last favor he was able to request was for them to kill Kim Groves. It was now around 5 o'clock on October 13th, and Lynn paged for Paul. Paul called Lynn, and they went over the plans to kill Kim. Paul was to be the designated shooter, while Lynn and Damon were tasked with cleaning up any evidence. They also planned what would happen after the murder. Lynn was supposed to meet Paul and Damon at the police station to view photos of homicide cases. Lynn and Damon met up. They drove around in Lynn's patrol car searching for Kim in the neighborhood. At around 7.30 that night, they picked Paul up and drove back to Kim's neighborhood and let Paul out so he could walk around and find her. Lynn then left the neighborhood again to take Paul home because they were having a hard time finding Kim. Lynn then drove around with his partner Samuel, but hours had gone by and still no Kim. Lynn ended up calling Paul complaining, but Paul reassured him that the job would get done. Finally, at around 10 o'clock p.m., Lynn and his partner spotted Kim near her home, so he immediately paged Paul. After calling Lynn back, Paul made his way to Kim's neighborhood. Samuel's shift was over, so by this time, he left Lynn alone in the patrol car. At around 10.45, Kim was still not dead, so he called Paul to complain once again. He described what Kim was wearing and how she looked in detail. At 11 o'clock, Paul found Kim and fatally shot her. Lynn was unaware of the FBI being on his trail, so they quickly found out he was behind the murder of Kim Groves. The FBI also busted nine other police officers employed with the NOPD as being corrupt officers and they were relieved of their duties. In December 1994, the government filed a federal indictment against Lynn, Paul, and Damon. All three men were tried together in front of a jury. In July 1995, the government filed two notices of intent to seek the death penalty for Paul and Lynn. In August 1995, the men were charged with conspiracy to deprive Kim of her civil rights while acting under color of state law, depriving Kim of her civil rights by use of excessive force by shooting her with a firearm resulting in death, and willfully killing Kim to prevent her communications to a law enforcement officer regarding a possible federal crime. On April 26, 1996, Lynn was sentenced to death, Paul was also sentenced to death, and Damon was sentenced to life in prison after he rejected a plea deal that would have given him six to nine years in prison. After Lynn was sentenced, he left the courtroom and refused to return. The Fifth Circuit reversed Lynn and Paul's death sentence when the conviction for witness tampering was overturned. After a new sentencing hearing, the new jury agreed with sentencing Lynn to death on October 27, 2006. Paul was also resentenced to death, but in 2011, his sentence was commuted to life when the judge found him to be mentally retarded. As of today, Lynn is currently on federal death row and is imprisoned at the U.S. Penitentiary Terre Haute in Indiana. Today's story is on Antoinette Frank, who is also a former NOPD officer and is currently on death row as well. New Orleans, Louisiana has had its ups and downs as a city throughout its history. From civil wars, natural disasters, and being the center of tourism, the one thing that has been difficult for New Orleans to shake has been corruption. There has also been a history of tension because the city wanted to handle its own affairs and the government of the state of Louisiana wanted to control the city. At one point during the 1930s, when Governor Huey P. Long and Mayor T. Sams Walmsley were in office, Armed city police officers and state troopers had a face-off at the Orleans Parish Line. Sidney John Bartholomew was mayor of New Orleans from 1986 to 1994. By the time Sidney was in office, government revenue sharing to municipalities had been reduced tremendously. New Orleans was once receiving about $40 million in annual funding from federal and state sources, but that number dwindled to $6 million. Sidney tried to help the city, but his plans made thousands of people lose their jobs. He was not so hands-on with the economic development of the city and wanted the private sector to be the main source of income for the city. At one point, he wanted to privatize public housing and demolish many private housing communities. Although there had been some success with him as a mayor, overall, the city's population continued to decline while the crime rate, murder rate, 
and drug use statistics continue to rise. Students in public schools were failing, and corruption had gotten so bad in the early 1990s that the FBI interjected themselves to try and help the community with their undercover operations. After one sting called Operation Shattered Shield that started in 1993, the FBI had evidence against a dozen officers who were involved in a protection racket. The New Orleans Police Department Chief, Richard Pennington, worked with the Department of Justice, the FBI, the U.S. Marine Corps, and the Louisiana State Police to improve the city's ethics education for department leaders, but over the years it has been hard for citizens to shake not having trust in authority. Some make the intention of doing well but get caught up in the same cycle of corruption, while others are thugs before receiving their badges and remain thugs after they obtain it. Born on April 30, 1971, Antoinette Frank grew up in the rough areas of New Orleans, Louisiana. She came from a broken home with her father Adam Frank coming in and out of her life at random times and a brother who grew up to become a fugitive. Antoinette grew up physically and mentally taken advantage of and struggled with mental health issues but kept them to herself. Despite her personal struggles, family struggles, and bad environment, she claimed that her dream was always to become a police officer. In June of 1992, Antoinette moved into a small house with her father, Adam, but in August of 1993, she said that he went missing again. He was never a constant in her life, so it was not abnormal for him to be gone, but that was the last time anyone had ever heard from him. That same year, Antoinette fought to make her dreams come true when she applied to the New Orleans Police Department. Antoinette was a young 22-year-old when she applied, but she lied on her application when it came to her mental health. One psychiatrist who examined her by the name of Philip Scuria said that she was shallow and superficial and should not be hired under any circumstances. Antoinette was still very determined to become an officer, and during this time, the NLPD lost many officers due to corruption, so they were in need of fresh officers. Antoinette ended up reapplying, and she was finally able to fulfill her dreams of wearing a badge. The NLPD doesn't and didn't hire any officers who did not live in New Orleans, and Antoinette did, so she was officially hired on February 7, 1993, and graduated from the police academy on February 28, 1993. On November 25, 1994, Antoinette responded to a shooting incident involving a drug dealer by the name of Rogers Lacaze. For some reason, Antoinette grew fond of Rogers, and they continued to communicate and socialize despite what he did for a living and the circumstances under which they met. Rogers grew sick from lead poisoning at one point, and Antoinette took care of him. Antoinette's fellow officers later testified that they witnessed her driving Rogers around in her police vehicle while she was on duty at the scene of an accident she was supposed to be investigating. On another occasion, she allowed Rogers to accompany her on a complaint call and introduced Rogers as her trainee. Sometimes she would even claim that Rogers was her nephew, but any time anyone decided to press the seriousness of their relationship, Antoinette would just respond by saying she was trying to help him out. In actuality, Antoinette did not feel like Rogers was a relative at all, and the two started a sexual relationship. They would engage in sexual intercourse in the back of her cruiser in alleys or sketchy areas. Sometimes these areas were where Rogers would be selling crack. With sex came love, and Antoinette fell for Rogers quick. She had been asked at a later date why she continued talking to Rogers when she knew of his criminal history, but she said that she was able to dissociate herself from him in his past. On February 4th, 1995, Rogers attended a party with two attendees of the party being John Stevens and Anthony Wallace. Rogers was having a verbal altercation with John Stevens, so Anthony Wallace suggested that Rogers leave the party. After Rogers left the party, Anthony and John ended up leaving the party as well and drove a couple of blocks away from where the party was being held. After a short while, Anthony and John were pulled over by a police car. Out of the vehicle comes Antoinette Frank, who is in her police uniform. She instructed the men to get out of the car and stand in front of the trunk area. Anthony said that he noticed Rogers was also there and had a weapon, so he rushed Rogers. Anthony and Rogers began fighting, and then John jumped in. After
after John got in on the fight, Antoinette joined as well. Next thing you know, a gun goes off and John starts running away. A bystander by the name of Irvin Bryant, who also happened to be a civil sheriff, grabbed Anthony and Rogers, breaking up their fight. Right before Irvin was able to grab Anthony, Anthony had picked up a Tech 9 semi-automatic gun out of the grass. He demanded Anthony drop the gun, and Anthony listened right away. Irvin thought he was helping a good cop, so when Antoinette told him that Rogers was the good guy and instructed him to release Rogers, he listened. She said that the other two were the ones who were causing problems. Irvin let go of Rogers and continued to hold Anthony down until backup came. Anthony Wallace was eventually arrested and charged with attempted murder and armed robbery, while Rogers was never questioned by police and never gave a formal statement. While Antoinette was busy building up her corrupt credentials, she was also working part-time as a security officer for a Vietnamese restaurant called Kim An. The Vu's were a kind family that ran the restaurant. Their children Quang, Ha, and Chow loved Antoinette. The whole family showered Antoinette with gifts, and any time she asked for something, the Vu's had no issues giving it to her. On March 4th, 1995, Antoinette and Rogers went to Kim An's twice that night to eat some free leftover food. Chow was working that night with her siblings, and she let Antoinette and Rogers out, but she was unable to find the front door key. Working as security that night was Antoinette's old partner, Officer Ronald Williams II. It was getting late, and it was slow, so the Vu's were getting ready to lock up and call it a night. Chow was still unable to find the front door key, but still decided to pay Officer Williams and let him leave for the night. She walked back to the kitchen to count the money and then entered the dining room to hand Officer Williams the money. She then noticed Antoinette and Rogers returning for the third time. Chow's instincts told her that something was not right, so she ran back to the kitchen and hid the money she had in the microwave. The reason why Chow was unable to find the key to the restaurant was because it was none other than Antoinette who had stolen it. With the stolen key, Antoinette unlocked the front door and walked right in with Rogers. They walked past Officer Williams and pushed Chow, her brother Kwok, and another employee into the doorway of the restaurant's kitchen. Officer Williams felt uneasy and followed the couple asking them what they were doing. As soon as Officer Williams addressed the situation, shots were fired. Antoinette went back into the dining room, and this gave Chow and Kwok enough time to hide inside of the rear walk-in cooler that was located in the kitchen. The shots that were fired came from Rogers. When Antoinette had walked the employees to the hallway, Rogers had stayed behind in the dining room, so when Officer Williams walked closer to Antoinette, it left Rogers behind Officer Williams. Rogers shot Officer Williams from the back, and it instantly paralyzed him. Rogers shot him two more times, and Officer Williams died right then and there. As mentioned before, Chow and Kwok were able to hide in the walk-in cooler, and they turned off the lights in the kitchen before heading there. Unfortunately, their siblings Ha and Kwong were in the dining room sweeping when Antoinette and Rogers walked in. Antoinette began looking in areas where the Vu's usually kept their money, but could not find anything. The couple yelled and demanded to be shown where the money was, but Ha and Kwong did not know where Chow hid the money. Kwong was pistol whipped and shot six times. Ha was shot three times. Both died at the scene of the crime while Antoinette and Rogers left empty handed. Kwok left the restaurant after the couple left, ran to a nearby friend's house and called 911. Chow tried calling 911 on her cell phone during the murders, but she had no service in the cooler. Antoinette and Rogers were now on the run. Antoinette dropped Rogers off at an apartment complex nearby, and being that she was a police officer, she had her scanner on and was able to hear the 911 call on her portable police radio stating that an officer was down at the Kim An restaurant. Antoinette drove back to the restaurant, but this time parked in the back and then entered through the back door of the restaurant. Antoinette then walked through the kitchen to the dining room where she saw Chow waiting by the front door for help to arrive. When Chow noticed Antoinette, she ran out of the front door towards the arriving officers. Antoinette followed and identified herself as a police officer. Antoinette then asked Chow, are you all right? Chow responded in broken English, why would you ask that? You were there, you knew it happened. 
that was enough for NLPD homicide detective Eddie Rance to start questioning Antoinette. Detective Rance had Chow and Antoinette enter the restaurant and they were both questioned at different tables. Detective Rance said at a later date that there was no doubt in his mind that Antoinette returned to the restaurant to kill the remaining witnesses. After being interrogated at the restaurant, she was taken into the police headquarters for further questioning. After being interrogated for a while, Antoinette confessed and ratted on Rogers in the process. Rogers was apprehended and they were both arrested and charged with first-degree murder. They were both indicted by an Orleans Parish grand jury on April 28, 1995, but they were tried separately. Rogers was tried from July 17th through the 21st, 1995, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Antoinette's trial began on September 5, 1995. Although her defense subpoenaed 40 witnesses, there was substantial evidence against Antoinette and they did little to come up with a strong defense. Antoinette was found guilty on September 12, 1995, and she was sentenced to death on October 20, 1995. A month after she was sentenced, a dog had dug up bones where Antoinette used to live. Police were led to a human skull that had parts missing, but they did notice a bullet hole in the skull. Many thought the remains belonged to Antoinette's father and that she was behind his disappearance. To date, though, not much has been done to identify the John Doe. On October 18, 2006, now represented by new attorneys, they argued that Antoinette's death sentence should be overturned because she was denied state-funded experts to help prepare for the sentencing phase of the trial. On May 22, 2007, the Louisiana Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty should be upheld. On April 22, 2008, Judge Frank Murillo signed the death warrant for Antoinette and her execution date by method of lethal injection was scheduled for July 15, 2008. When May came around, the Louisiana Supreme Court issued a 90-day stay of execution pending ongoing appeals. After her 90-day stay was over, a second death warrant was signed by the same judge. On November 25, 2008, the Louisiana State Supreme Court made the decision to cancel the death warrant signed by Judge Murillo again due to ongoing appeals. Antoinette fought for Judge Murillo to be taken off of her case because he had signed her death warrant twice. At first, her request was denied, but in 2010, it was ruled that Judge Murillo had to be recused from the case because it was unclear if he had been open with the defense teams about his own connection to the gun used in the restaurant murders. Antoinette is currently one of two women on Louisiana's death row at the St. Gabriel Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women. Rogers claims that he is as innocent as the victims who died that unfortunate night, but he is also on death row, but in Angola, and while on death row, he received a short letter from Antoinette that read, Stick to your innocence. I'm proud of you. God keep you. In a quote from Murderpedia, Initially, the Vu family's restaurant in New Orleans East remained opened at the site of the tragedy. Hurricane Katrina damaged the restaurant in 2005, and post-storm looters stole jewelry which Ha and Kwong had been wearing when they were killed. After that, Kwok and his mother sold the old location and reopened in a new city where they felt much safer. And now for a discussion and question time. If you lived in a city where a cop is behind the murder of your family and a majority of the officers in the precinct are corrupt, do you think that you would feel more safe having people in the community handle your affairs? Is that why some say snitches get stitches? Is that the reason for having street code? Wouldn't it be a never-ending cycle of the same things and the same negative feelings towards the people who are supposed to protect and make you feel safe? Living in a city that has always made its people feel unsafe? What do you think needs to happen in order for those people to feel safe again? To have trust again? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. My second question is, if a cop or judge is found to have gotten people in trouble based off of lies, do you think their past cases should be investigated? The situation where Antoinette defended Rogers and had an innocent man locked up while her boyfriend didn't have to be questioned at all is crazy. 